Hello and welcome to another edition of Willow Talk. Adam Peacock here with Lisa Healy. Hills, how are you? I'm very well, thank mm. you. How are you? Good. Probably not as well as Bradley Haddon, who's sitting in business class at the moment being wined and dined because he stuffed his days up, our dear friend. Mm. He was meant to be here this week, yep. but forgot that Thursday is not Wednesday and Wednesday is not Thursday. So he stuffed his round, uh, stuffed it up a little bit. But anyway, he's going for a very noble and important cause, isn't he? Well, he's claiming he's going for a wedding, but his mm. beautiful wife, Karina, is actually captain of the Australian team that's over there playing the World Cup for touch football. Mm. So That I, was the afterthought, wasn't it? Yeah, I hope he's trip, going yeah. for that reason and not the mate's wedding in Hungary, but um, mm. yet to be seen. How are you going at the moment? Is it pre-season mode, planning mode, chill out mode? What is it? Pre-season mo uh, mode, everything is um, creaking, cracking, um, <laughs> sore in the morning, but... Um, just prepping for what's going to be a huge summer, which I'm very excited about and excited to see some cricket back on the TV. Yeah. This episode, we've got the secret cricket club to ask you some mm. quick fire questions. Exactly. But another one from me for the start of it. So when you've got, I mean, your schedule is ridiculous from, when is it? Start of September onwards, yeah. pretty much. When you've got this time, is it, I need a total refresh or is it, I've got to put in the steps to make sure that I'm at my best for that. And it is a long period of time that you're going to be going full tilt at. Um, let me put it this way. I'm not, I'm not the best, um, trainer <laughs> on tour in particular. So when we're on the road a lot of the year, I, mm. I tend to um, keep to myself a little bit and, and refresh then. So when we get times of downtime here, I'm actually um, put to the sword a little bit and made to train really hard. So to get myself right for that. So Time at home equals punishment, but at the same time, it's time at home. So it's good. You're fitting in the odd round of golf. So there is downtime. It's not full on all the yep. time. But for you, in terms of preparation, is it time in the nets? Is it time of the gloves on? Is it going for 5K runs to keep fit? What mm. What's the main focus? Mm, it's more physical. I actually leave the skills till last. Some, some people love to scrub the bat straight away and jump in the nets and try and fix everything for six months. But I actually... Best when fresh is the way that I approach it. And it's more physical for me, like get in the gym, go for a run, um, do what you need to do just to make sure that physically, um, you're ready to go, but also mentally fresh as well. So when you do come around to pick up the bat, um, fix a few technical things and, and off, off you go, you, you don't forget how to bat in, you know, six weeks or I would hope not eight <laughs> weeks off. So sometimes these little down periods are so good at, um, just refining things that you've struggled with over the last 12 months when you're on the road, you can't yeah. necessarily fix everything on the road. So, um, fix a few issues and then off you go again. Run us through this, this, um, diary that you've got from September <laughs> onwards, because we're not going to see you much here on Willow Talk, are we? We might talk to you a little bit, but not in person. <laughs> um, it's busy, but it's, it's exciting summer. So we go to New Zealand at home, straight to Bangladesh for a T20 World Cup. WBBL, obviously at home, mm -hmm. India at home, New Zealand away, um, the Ashes, which is huge. Obviously we're a summer early, the boys are, are next year, but they've split the Ashes for the men's and the women's. So mm -hmm. we're going to finish out the summer in Australia with a test match at the MCG, a day night test match at the MCG, which is pretty cool. End of January. Uh, end of Jan. Yep. yep. And then we go to New Zealand to finish our summer and then obviously um, WPL after that. So it's, it's a hectic eight months, but um, lots of cricket and lots of big big series as well, which is yeah. cool. India at home is going to be really cool, but the ashes is going to be massive. Yeah, absolutely. So no wonder you haven't got much, uh, <laughs> much downtime. That's why my feet are up. Can you fit us in occasionally? Yeah. While I talk? I'll be here. Yeah, I'm man. not like Hads and just disappear, but um, I'll be available. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. One, one on the WBBL schedule yep. came out. Mm -hmm. Um, I think since the last time we talked, Yep. okay with it, or would you have liked to have seen a few more matches in bigger stadiums? Um, I'm okay with it. I think mm. dropping the number back down to 10 games a side has meant that we are playing more at the big stadiums. There'll still be double headers. So I think we play the Renegades first up in Adelaide, but at yep. least it's Adelaide Oval. We actually play after the strikers play there. So they're in the Arvo, we're in the evening. So I like their thinking around um, putting the schedule that way. So I think, I think it's exciting and it's mm. probably a great chance for the fans to 
to give us a little bit of love. Uh, I mean, they, they turn up in droves at North Sydney, but now's an opportunity to come to the SCG again and mm. um, and show their support and, and give um, the WBBL a bit more love in the bigger stadiums, which I'm excited for. Excellent. Excellent. So for, for this episode, now that we've got the important stuff. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Well, Enough about me. Until the Secret Cricket Club <laughs> a bit later on. And thank you again to all our listeners who have got on uh, Instagram and got onto the Secret Cricket Club tab and asked a few questions of heels in here. We've got today. We're going to have a look at uh, Australia's men's white ball tour of the UK. Squad's a name. James Anderson signs off with a win and uh, downs a Guinness in pretty quick time. Well done to he. Uh, punter is punted. Well, I don't know. I don't know what exactly has happened at Delhi, but we'll chat about that a little bit. And of course, the Secret Cricket Club uh, programming update before we get into it, by the way. The Willow Talk team is taking a short break over the next few weeks. Actually, the team isn't. Producer Sam is going off on a well earned <laughs> holiday, basically. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm still available, but I'm just in another part of the world. I was still happy to jump behind the microphone, but the dude who actually puts it together, because if he's not here, the, the show's screwed. So producer Sam's just going on a bit of a, a well-earned holiday, which fair is fair enough. enough. We've actually lined up three great guests. Um, and first of which next Thursday, you'll hear from Brad Haddon's favorite cricketer, Phoebe Litchfield as well. So we've had that chat with Phoebes. Mm. It's a really good one, I will say, and mm. I didn't realise just how much of a fan Brad Haddon was until he was sitting right across from her in this very studio, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it looks. Yes, and sounds and sounds, and sounds as well. So that will be available. The Willow Talk uh, feed will be populated over the next few weeks with some extended chats, and I think we can reveal the other two as well. Mark Taylor mm. coming in to chat captaincy, especially in his career, and Mike Whitney who came in with Fair Dinkum, the state library of cricket stories, like the amount of stories. I think we asked about three questions each during that whole chat. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised he left, yeah. to be honest with you. <laughs> and the chat went 90 minutes. Yeah. So, oh, man, has he got some stories. He got some stories. Anyway, we're going to look forward now. And um, thank you once again to all our listeners for building Willow Talk on Instagram and uh, all the other social media platforms that we've got, TikTok and the like. Let's now talk about the Australian men's squad that's heading over for three T20s in Scotland at the start of September, backed up by three T20s against England from September 11, 13, 15, and then five one days in England. So they've split the squads a little bit. Pat Cummins has been totally rested from everything. Mitch, Mitchell Stark, is being managed for the T20 leg of the tour. He'll only play the one day as Glenn Maxwell as well. Spencer Johnson, Xavier Bartlett in the T20 squad. Jake Fraser McGurk set to replace, looks like on paper, David Warner. What do you make of these squads? Yeah, I, I mean, I like it. These are the exact series um, that we start to look at the next generation, especially after a World Cup. It's gone. It hasn't quite gone the way that we wanted it to finish. Um, so why not throw a couple of the youngsters in there in the T20 format in particular and say, here you go, here's your crack at international cricket. Let's see what you got. Are you in our thinking in 18, uh, 18 months' time for the next T20 World Cup? So um, I like it. Cooper Connolly, a bit of a... Um, a smoky that's come into the squad, but I mean, just reward after, um, you know, some really consistent seasons in the BBL. So yeah, it's cool. I mean, I get Mitch at home for a, an extra couple of weeks, so I can't complain, can I? But, Put him to work. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, this is the time to try, I think. And, and there's some guys in there that um, have been on the road a little bit as well. I mean, you look at Tim David, he's been on the road nonstop. Um, but for someone like Pat Cummins and, and knowing the summer that's ahead for the boys, having mm. an opportunity to have a break for a couple of them, um, probably really crucial. Yeah, interesting. A, a few things. Cooper Connolly being one of them. You mentioned it right there, former Australian under-19 captain. Made a bit of a name for himself, Perth Scorchers, especially the season before last. But I, I saw him in the Shield final where he accelerated the game. Okay, Tasmania, not exactly West Indies 1984 <laughs> attack, but he still kind of made an imprint on that game, an impression. So... Yeah, he gets his chance over, you'd say he's going to play at least half of those six games to rotate the squad. And the, these are the type of tours that, okay, you go from game to game. You've got a fair idea before you go what your eleven's going to be in each one? Or do you go off net form? How do you, how do you approach this? Mm, I dare say the way that it looks like they've set it out is they're probably going to try a, a few things, which means they've probably got it in their head as to who's especially the quicks, who's going to play which game mm -hmm. um, and how much we will see the, the younger players get a go. So I, I'd dare say that's mapped out and probably more the 50 over um, games against England will be 
um, a bit more on selection, I would have thought, see who's going well, who's not mm. so going so well. And um, they're going to be, that's a really strong squad that they've picked. So that's going to be hard for it to get in that side. Well, Josh Inglis, it looks like uh, he's got soul crack with the gloves for mm. the T20s at least, because there's no other, unless I'm missing something here, there's no other keeper or possible keeper in that squad. So he's going to play that. And then he's head to head with Alex Carey in the, the one day. So they've kept Alex Carey in the, the one day squad mm -hmm. as well, which is, um, yeah, after they swap positions at the last 50 over World Cup. Mm. Yeah, well, I think Josh Inglis deserves a, a crack at the T20 stuff in particular. He obviously earned his place in the ODI stuff, but... The T20s, you know, the format that he's a real powerhouse at and he's mm. obviously beautiful, got beautiful hands behind the stumps. So is Alex Carey in the one-day format. So I think that one's going to be based around what the 11 is that they're going to pick. Are they going to go with the firepower of Inglis with the bat and, and add that extra batting prowess or are they going to go with Alex Carey, who we know is going to be really solid um, at that lower mm. middle order. So that one will be <clears throat> um, dependent on the 11, but... It's cool for both of them to, to be included and get some experience. Yeah, and the three big quicks that are going to spearhead the attack when India get here for the Test Series later this year. So three varying ways of doing it. Josh Hazelwood's playing both. He's in both squads. Mitch is only in the one-day squad. And Pat is left right out. He's playing a bit of major league cricket. Mm. The other two, Josh isn't in that, is he, in America. So Pat's going to rest after that major league cricket, it looks like, and, and build himself up for that. Uh, there's a white ball tour, Pakistan are visiting here. So, mm. yeah, three different ways of managing three pretty big workloads ahead of the summer. Well, I think Josh will probably feel like he hasn't played a lot of cricket. He didn't go to the IPL, obviously, um, become a new, new father. So he's been at home for a lot of the year. So he's probably stuck his hand up and said, I want to go, I want to play, I want to get as much cricket under my belt leading into the summer. Um, but yeah, you could see why the other two are probably waving the flag for a little bit of a break. Yeah. Although we did have Mitch in here last week when you were um, elsewhere and did mention that the, the golf tour to Scotland, he's missed out on that. Has he got the shits there? Or? To, to be honest, I thought he was going um, <laughs> until that was, I heard him on the phone the other morning and then all of a sudden he said he's home for a couple more weeks and I was like, damn it. <laughs> but, you weren't. You said, "Get the victor out, pal. You're on the mower." Yeah. I was like, "Well, there's Start some growing season. There's some boxes over there that need unpacking, so off you go." But um, yeah, I he will probably be more disappointed about not the golf missing the golf in Scotland than the cricket. Plenty of time for that. Plenty of time for that. So the champion, a reminder, Champions Trophy in February. Uh, that's in Pakistan. T mm. Twenty World Cup, eighteen months away. That is in Sri Lanka and India. Three years until the twenty twenty seven One Day World Cup. I mean, it feels like because there's so much cricket that it's ever evolving anyway. So how much planning can you do with squads? Well, I think the the first part of it will be who out of the senior group will still be there. I think mm. that would be the where you start and you say, can we get, um, can we get Mitch Stark to that World Cup? Is he's still going to be good enough to be at that World Cup? Um, you looked at the the Aussie squad at the T20 World Cup and the ODI World Cup, they're quite, they're older. Mm. Can we get them through? If not, or if they've decided they're not playing, then okay, when, where do we put the, the young kids in and test the depth that we've got in the, the varying roles that we're going to need? So I, th I don't think you can necessarily like point out a number of matches or series that you're going to get it right. I think by, by the time that tournaments roll around, you're, you're picking based on form, but at least you're giving guys opportunities in the spots where you think that they might play in those big tournaments. Jimmy Anderson, succession planning <laughs> looks to be in its infancy with England, but I mean, seriously, how do you replace a guy who's taken 704 wickets? You don't. We've had it here in Australia with people like Shane Warne and Glenn McGray. He's just got to evolve the team somehow. So Jimmy played his last ever test, the first test against the West Indies, West Indies by an innings and 114 runs at Lords last week. Second test gets underway uh, Thursday night Australian time against the Windies. Trent Bridge is the venue for that one. But um, what can you say about this guy? 704 wickets from 188 tests. There's not much left to be <laughs> said. I think uh, like his stats speak for themselves. Um, unbelievable servant to, to English cricket, um, in particular the the Test game and and how they prior, prioritise that to to get the best for results for their sides. Um, but yeah, I think what a way to go out to kind of be able to to choose. I guess the way to finish. I mean, if you're going to finish at Lords, I mean, yeah. I would have thought maybe you know you'd want to finish up at Manchester, but. 
I mean, the finish of Lords is pretty cool. Stand on the balcony with your pint of Guinness and in front of a thousand people. And you're never quite sure if the Old Trafford test is going to be rained out. Yeah. So you don't <laughs> want it to end that way. But yeah, Lords is the place where you'd, you'd want to finish as an English cricketer. But it was interesting how it was reported in the first place about the, the discussion. It was... Hmm. It was reported that Brennan McCullum actually flew over from New Zealand to have a discussion face to face with Jimmy Anderson. I think they went out for a game of golf, and it was kind no of surprise. yeah. It was kind of reported that Brendan McCullum was advising him to go down this path, whether or not he was ready to or not. Look, we don't know where the truth is, but it was nice to see the fact that he embraced the end like it. Did. It made you feel like, oh yeah, maybe he did get his head around the fact that this is the perfect time. To go, well, even though he's like, he's not 41 body wise, he looks 31. Still. Yeah. Well, that's what surprised me that when I think it was you guys that broke the news to me that he didn't choose, but I, I wondered if the discussion was, Jimmy, you're not getting to the next Ashes series. They were already talking about planning for coming to Australia in, mm. um, next summer. They're already talking about that in a series over there at the West Indies. It was probably a discussion of, we're not going to take you. Um, we need to start blooding some young players. Do you want to pick a test match to go this summer? And maybe he went and I'll take the first one. Thanks. But mm. yeah, I, it would surprise me if he didn't get to choose. Yeah. He nearly had the golden finish. It's, uh, <laughs> he dropped a, a return yeah. catch, unfortunately. <laughs> Gus Atkinson was the star of the test. 12 wickets. His haul of 12 for 106 is the fourth best by a debutant in test cricket history. So they've identified Gus Atkinson. They put... Jofra Archer on a long-term contract as well, mm -hmm. ECB contract. Uh, they got Mark Wood back in for this second test. He's the like for like. They rested Wood from the first one. So he's a player that they're going to have to manage all the way through to the Ashes. So, yeah, you, you may mention there before that the detail of the planning already for a series 18 months. Away, they're going to play a lot of cricket before then. It's Well, I think they've they've probably realise that the World Test Championship is Gonski for the year, even yeah. though they, they talked a big game and, and that was a priority for their test side. They've they kind of realised. This summer, their summer bottom of that ladder, yeah. no, they could improve their yeah. standings, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Well, yeah, that's Dunsky, right? So let's let's think about what the next big thing for us is. It's the Ashes. So um, let's use this as an opportunity to do it and good luck to them. It's different conditions, different ball, but you can mm. give it a crack. Now, Jimmy did something that I'd never do and that's have a glass of Guinness in your hand in the first place. It's not my drink, but he ripped it down. Yeah. Away it went. Fantastic. Well done, Jimmy. What a way to go out. So you're, when you retire <laughs> and you're standing on that balcony, what's your drink of choice up there? Uh, is it in England? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Can be anywhere. Oh. Wherever um, it is. I don't know. Actually, that's, that's put me on the spot. Yeah. It would be a beer of some sort or a Canadian club that would that'd go down real nice after a day of play. Okay. But I don't think you'd see me on the balcony. You'd see me walking out the back door. You probably, you just wouldn't even <laughs> see me do it in front celebrating. of the, the team. Yeah. Out you? the back door. See you later. <laughs> yeah. Well, he enjoyed the adulation, Jimmy Anderson, and congratulations again on that magnificent career. Uh, Ricky Ponting, this is an interesting move. Ricky Ponting and the Delhi Capitals have parted ways after seven seasons. Now, Delhi haven't made the IPL finals for the past three seasons. Yeah. Do you see this coming? Yeah, Ricky's got a bit on. He's mm. here, there and everywhere. He's coaching over in the Major League Cricket. And when he's not coaching, it seems he's commentating. Mm. He's another guy like Hads. Doesn't like being home, obviously. But he's, um, did this, did you see this one? Yeah, I did. Only because being over there in India this year and kind of watching it live and watching it from an Indian perspective, um, it just didn't seem right in the dugout. There was um, obviously a bit going on. It seemed like there was tension between, you know, support staff and I don't know, the players all seemed like they were okay. Like Rishabh Pant was um, in charge and, and looked quite relaxed, but it just didn't look right. Mm. So um, it's no real surprise to me that if you, you know, you put um, an international coach up against, you know, an Indian icon that the international coach um, will probably part ways. But um, I mean, it's opened up a, probably a whole new avenue for Ricky to look at and will it be coaching, you know, an international sign or will he stick to franchise cricket or will he mm. do whatever, it, whatever else he wants to do? Um, it's opened up a bit of time for him. So it'd be interesting. Could you see him coaching Australia at any point? The, I would, I would think the boys would absolutely love that. I mean, mm. um, I only speak from my household and, and the respect that, that we have for Ricky Ponting in our household is, is rather large. Um, but he, he can hold a room if he stands in a room and is talking to a, a group of cricketers, um, they're listening and they're paying mm. attention. So, I'd love to see it. I think um, splitting the 
the roles, whether it be white ball, red ball, um, could be a way that, you know, Australia looked to do things down the track. But, yeah, I think that, yes, definitely. And mm. I think maybe that next generation coming through would be, he'd be an unbelievable mentor for that group. Well, good luck to Brad Haddon and Delhi. Sorry, I'm getting <laughs> a tad presumptuous there, but uh, I'm not sure if Hads is going to. I think he's know. already put his resume in. That's what I heard. He? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it only dropped yesterday and he's already <laughs> slipped it in there. Hello to everyone from uh, Punjab <laughs> Kings as well, if you're listening to this, <laughs> where Brad is, I think, still contractually obliged to be the assistant coach there at that particular <laughs> franchise. But a bit of news there from India. We're going to take a quick break. Back with some secret cricket club questions for the Australian women's captain. So the secret cricket club. And when we mentioned this to um, Heels, the the response was, what's that? So a little bit of education on our Instagram, on the Willow Talk Instagram page. You'll see a little thing just under all our profile and everything like that, uh, the, the bio. It says secret cricket club. Click on that. You can go in and producer Sam always puts up a few questions up there or we're doing this. So do you want to ask a question on this topic or of this person? You're here today at Heels. Yeah. So you're this person. So Well, initially when I heard Secret Cricket Club, it worried me. Um, it's mm. not. I There's did, been a few of those around the, the world. Yeah. I was a little bit, um, hang on a minute. And why aren't I invited? Um, yeah. Turns out I was invited. I just have, didn't even know what it was. So I'm excited for it. You Did you think it was along the lines of like at the Australian Golf Club in Sydney with the men's only locker room that Kerry Packer built back in the day? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is open to anyone, the Secret Cricket Club. It's a contradiction. Yeah. It's a secret, but anyone can have a crack and anyone can ask a question. And we ask some members for questions for Hills and they have delivered. Mitch, no last name attached to this one. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite innings you've watched and your own favorite? Oh, I'd tell you what, <clears throat> still my favorite innings that I've seen was I was lucky enough to be at the first ever IPL game um, and where Brendan McCullum made 150 odd for, for Kolkata against RCB. 2008? Chinnaswamy Stadium. Yeah, I was there for that, which was really cool. And then Chris Gale made 100 or something in the, the chase, but they lost. But um, Brennan McCullum's innings is something that I, I don't think I'll ever forget. That was pretty cool. Cool. Your um, own favourite? Come uh, on. Talk yourself up here. I know you love doing this. Yeah, this is hard. Well, probably that scratchy 30 that, you know, you're, like, you're not sure about. It. Not the one at Hagley? <laughs> no, I think um, oh, Hagley was pretty cool. No, I think... My first ODI ton in, in India and in Baroda was um, still hands down probably my favourite. I've been a part of some other amazing things, but um, that was, yeah, the turning point for me, which was cool. How old were you at the time? <laughs> it was, I was later on in my career, but um, I don't know. It was it was a little while ago. Um, forgotten how old I was, but it was. I didn't exactly start my career like a Meg Lanning or an Elise Perry. It took me a while to find my feet. So to finally tick off an, an ODI ton for me was a a huge milestone that then I think gave me the confidence to keep going. Looking back on it now, and I purely ask this on the basis of maybe it's something that you can talk to a young player coming through now. Mm -hmm. Why was that, that it took a little while to get going on the international Um, stage? I don't, I genuinely didn't really think I was good enough. I think deep down, I I probably portrayed a really confident, flary style of cricketer. Um, But I think deep down, I didn't really know what I was doing and I didn't, have the confidence to think that I could compete. I mean, I'm standing at the other end, um, in Meg Lanning's debut and she's hitting them everywhere and I can't hit them off the square. And Mm. I grew up playing with her and all of a sudden she's finding international cricket easy and I don't even know what I'm doing down the other end. feel like I'm holding bat the other way. So it was sort of, yeah, it took me a while to, to feel comfortable. It probably was when Moddy gave me the, the role to open the, the batting and gave me a license to do all that. Um, kind of made me feel like I belonged, but I always just wanted to contribute and go home and I um, mean celebrate the wins. It didn't bother me if I was making hundreds or not. So helps making hundreds because then you get to stay in the team and celebrate the wins. It also turns out if you're making hundreds, the team generally wins. So um, I didn't <laughs> hadn't quite put two and two together by that point. Fair enough. Uh, Sharma asks, would you play in the women's CPL? Yeah, actually, definitely. I um, the KKR owner um, Venki was was into me and in, uh, over in Kolkata about coming over and playing. They obviously own the um, one of the teams over there about playing in that, but, um, they pick Meg Lanning instead. So I get it, but, um, yeah, definitely. I think it's looking to expand as well over the next few years. So it's definitely a cool opportunity. When it, th- does it matter primarily when in the calendar it falls? A little bit. It's right off the back of the hundred this year. So it's, it's only about 10 days long cause there's only a 
I think three or four teams in it this year. So yep. um, when it expa- expands and becomes a little longer, it's going to get tricky, but um, straight off the back of the hundred makes it easy for people to get to. Brody asks, who is the hardest bowler you've kept to? Oh, so um, not necessarily the fastest, but yeah. the most difficult to pick up. I tell you what, um, the one who's damaged my fingers the most over the years would have to be Nick Carey. Um, mm. He played played a bit for Australia, but um, obviously a really great um, Tasmanian and Hobart player at the moment. Um, you'd have to, she'd like you to keep up to the stumps, but she bowls skiddy, like disgusting medium pace and quite skillful with the ball. Yeah. So a lot of my crooked fingers are, are keeping up to the stumps to her. So she's not nice. I, I often look at that mm. at keepers and they come up to sometimes fast medium. Yeah. Because it's like, why? It looks like a death wish. Um, keep batter in the crease. It's basically oh, it. Like so They can go out of their crease as far as I'm concerned. Sometimes I go up there and say, uh, do you want me up or back? Cause like hoping that they'd say go back cause you suck. But they're all like, no, stay up. It'll be, it'll be good. And then they throw one down leg and you're like, blah, down the side. So, um, Nick Carey and Talia McGraw up there as well, um, hmm. in that skill set and they, the balls nip everywhere and it's just disgusting. Yeah. I could imagine though, if you're up to the stumps to a medium fast, fast medium and you pull off a stumping, now that's, a, oh. it, it looks spectacular. Yeah. I don't think anything looks better. Maybe a diving catch three meters down leg side, but that in terms of skill, mm. like, does that feel that way for the person who's actually doing it? Uh, yep. Yeah. Well, I think last summer, I think was it Alex Carey took a catch, um, up to the stumps off. Yep. Um, I can't, I forgot that. Yeah, no, no, no. It. I remember it. Yeah. I, was I it Nisa? It, anyway. I think it was Nisa. Anyway. Um, and yeah, Alex Carey coming up to the stumps to a genuine quick in, in the men's game, like a medium mm. pace of it. That for me as a wiki keeper, I was like, well, yeah. Like we know how hard that is. And I think the, the, um, the chat around it was just like, oh, nice catch, move on. But all of us keepers were like, oh yeah, that's a goodie. Cause that <laughs> is uncomfortable. Andy asks, any chance of bringing back the baseball face shield and the backwards cap? Talk us through this one. I don't know what Andy means by that, but no. Oh, I see. I know what Andy it's means clicked. by that. Um, with Jody Field. So the, um, uh, the former Australian captain that was, the Australian keeper, um, basically before me, um, used to wear a, a baseball mask to nice. keep instead of a helmet. Um, cause I was trying to think when you did that and yeah. I, I've seen you in the helmet, but no, nah. nah, not the baseball grill. Um, yeah, she rocked that. I, I never really got anything other than a helmet. So, um, I probably won't bring it back, but I have seen it used in international cricket and it's, it's an interesting way to go about it. What's the difference? Well, there's no helmet part. So you literally just, which as a keeper, you're generally just protecting your face. Mm. So I could see the, the reasoning for it, but, um, I think the way that, and how unco I am, I need the whole helmet. (laughs) I'm more than likely not looking when someone's throwing the ball back and it's going to hit me in the helmet. So I need the whole thing. Have you ever chucked the helmet away behind and given away the five? No. You've never done it? Never, but I've been really close. (laughs) When you put it behind you and one of the quicks is bowling and one sneaks through your legs, it's a terrifying feeling. Yeah. But it's not really a thing anymore. They only really pin you if, um, you know, if it's genuinely in the way. But what I get the grumps at the umpires the most is when they tell you it's not straight. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. I could put it behind third slip and it might get hit even more. So what's your, what's it to you? You're allowed to put it anywhere, aren't you? Yeah. What's it to you? Oh, okay. What's it to you? Yeah. That'll get the umpires on side for a close LP. Well done. Darren asks, who's someone you think you can bowl to and get them out? Um, well, I've got Lisa Stalaker out a couple of times, so I'm going to go with her and, um, and you remind her of her oh, regularly. Okay. Um, I've got a couple, I claim it as international wicket, so I've technically <laughs> got one. Um, anyone, I'm, if you float around WBBL training, um, mm. throughout the year, I'm more often bowling than doing anything else. So come and have a watch if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Generally at the lower order who think they can slog everything. Okay. So a follow up, Tom asks, who's better, you or Hads with his flippers? All right. I can't bowl a flipper, but um, I know Hads can't bowl a leg spinner, so I can bowl a leg spinner. You can land a leggy? Yeah. So regularly? I think my bowling's more versatile than Hads if all he can do is bowl a flipper, mm. as skillful as that may, may be. Are you along the lines of an Alana King? No, I I was perfecting the art in South Africa last year with Georgia Wareham and yeah. um, and our um, one of our coaches is a spinner and we were try- he was trying to teach me the flipper because mm. Wolfie's been learning it. Um, and I was absolutely useless. I was hitting the side net, but I can bowl a leggy, I can bowl a toppy and I yeah. can almost bowl a wrong. And so versatility is mm. key. 
is it one of those things that you look at and you go, oh, I feel like I've, like I've, I've, got, I've got this style down pat and things like that. And then you see it back in video and go, is that what I look like? I, I've seen myself bowl a, a seam up delivery and yeah. I look like I'm bowling off spin. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my technique's quite right. <laughs> <laughs> Damien asks, how often do you change your bat and is it different for each format? Well, funnily enough, Damien, I can tell you that I am one that does not change mine. So I, I'm lucky, luckily enough have been sponsored by Kookaburra my whole career. And um, we've gotten to a point where, um, our bat, maker literally has to send me bats because he's like, you haven't taken bats for 12 months. Can you please get a new one? Um, so I, I don't change them for format. I just literally tinker around with, um, the style, the shape a little bit every now and then every couple of years. But at the moment I use it until it dies. I've been using one. I stole out of Manus Labashane's bat, um, at the world test championship last year. You stole one. Um, well, he knows I've got it okay. and he ended up like caving and giving it to me, but I picked one out of his thousand that he had in his kit and said, this is the best bat in your bag. And he said, no, it's not. And he ended up caving and said, if I don't use it by Manchester and um, the ashes, um, Elisa can have it. So he, it ended up in Mitch's kit and I've got it and I, I've used it. The face is starting to fall off it now. It's been awesome. Okay. Well, hopefully it makes you take catches like you did in the hunt, uh, the <laughs> T20 blast a couple of weeks ago. I can't do that, but I can, <laughs> I can hit the ball like he does. <laughs> How many bats are... How many bats do you have? Do you keep your old ones? Yeah. Well, this is the, the punishment of moving house at the moment is we just have a graveyard of cricket bats. I'm quite generous and I just give them to, if young kids at the club need a new cricket bat, I've got heaps that I... I'd um, faint if you'd hand it like, what? Yeah. Or like coaches Pretty take cool. them and cut them down and use them as, as catching bats. But I, I've still got every one that um, I've basically used over time. And some of the really ones that are, are special to me are, um, are locked away. That have been I was going to say stones. you've kept the significant ones. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. Well, we we're talking hundreds of bats between you two. Nah, not that many. We give away a lot, but there'd okay. be at least thirty just sitting in the garage at the minute. Far out. So please don't steal them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a security system on your house, and <laughs> you'll be right. Uh, Dylan asks, "Do you think that playing golf affects or helps you with your cricket?" Um, I know what you're going to say here because you want to keep playing. Dylan, technically, it does not help me with my cricket, but mentally it does. So I figure they even one another out. In what way? Well, it gives me the mental break that I need to then yep. go to training and fix everything that um, golf's just undid to my bat swing. <laughs> um, but well, basically cricket's very straight lined. It's, you know, forward and back golf's mm. rotational. So the, the more you rotate in cricket in my particular technique, the worse it is. So it's actually just trying to find a balance. I know that mm. John Holland down in Victoria um, used to, by the back end of his career, just stopped batting in the nets altogether because he was off plus two, plus three at golf. And so he just refused to touch his cricket bat because <laughs> it was going to ruin his golf swing. So Hang on, but he was a cricketer. <laughs> yep. And he refused to, to pick up his cricket bat. He bowled, luckily he bowled really well and he wasn't an all-rounder. But um, they're not great for one another, but you can do both. It, physically, it doesn't hinder you what you're trying to do either? No, it loosens loosens me up for the physio every, every week that I got to go in and do some testing. I'm good to go. Yeah. Well, it's better than some of the other hobbies that you could have like surfing or mm -hmm. paragliding or things like that. It is. Parkour. Yep. Less dangerous unless it's Saturday morning at Long Reef Golf Club because I've got a target on me and there's balls literally mm. landing next to me. Sorry about that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Zach asks, who's the biggest pest you've played with? I love these questions. Um, on Zach. Biggest pest. Probably Megan shoot. I think most people would say me if they asked that question. So I'm just going to lob it on someone else. You can't be now because you're yeah, the captain. That's right. I'm not allowed to be the best. Um, still can be. Um, can be but... Megan shoot. She's all a bit older and mature now. So Phoebe Litchfield's about to take over that role. I can feel it. Yeah. Yeah. That chat, as mentioned, coming next week on Willow Talk. Um, I can see it. Yep. I can see it coming as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good personality about her old Phoebe. Especially so. if her starts getting in her ears, she's in strong. Oh, can you imagine? <laughs> yep. uh, Anthony asks, favorite Starkey moment you've witnessed? Oh, yeah. So Mitch got asked in reverse last week about this one. I don't know if you know what he said, but what's your favorite moment you've uh, witnessed of his career? Um. I watched his um, test debut, which was pretty cool. Richie Benno gave him his cap. Me and his mum were sitting at the Gabba um, in the family area, like clapping away. And um, my favourite part of it is that he was like white. So before he went out to 
bowl. Mm. They bowled first. He like kind of turned to us and waved and he was like white and he didn't say a thing. And they walked in at lunch and he didn't say a thing either. He kind of like looked up and he was like waved at us. He was so nervous. And then nervous. by the end of play, he was over and he was giving us a hug and he was okay. waving and saying hello. He just didn't quite know where to be or like <laughs> how to, how to act. Um, so that was cool. But, um, the 2015 world cup, that first over was something I was sitting there. It's the same. He was sitting there for the, the World Cup final. Um, yeah, it was a roar I've never experienced before. Yeah. yeah it's a theme in this room, that particular moment. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> for some reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He said your T20 uh, World Cup win, the 2020 yep. uh, final at the G, 171-day uh, World Cup final in Christchurch and also getting your baggy green yep. as well. Um, so there was his three moments. You've only got two for him. That's fair enough. Uh, Christopher asks, what do you feel are the differences between Meg's and your captaincy? This is a good question. Um, yeah, very good. Thanks, Christopher. Um, <laughs> uh, we're just like, we're just very different people and very different cricketers and, and leaders as well. I think traditionally, and, and I just touched on it before, like traditionally throughout my career, I haven't. I haven't been the one out the front that's been, you know, dragging the team along. Um, that was Meg's. And um, interestingly enough, like being able to talk to Mark Taylor about, you know, Alan Border and taking over from him, that was AB. He literally grabbed the team um, by the scruff of the neck, said, jump on my back. I'm going to take us through whatever we're about to do. And Meg, that was literally Meg. She led, led from the front. She was hands down, you know, the best batter in the side. And um, for me, it's just more about, in inclusivity and just getting everybody to be a leader within the team as well. Um, it's not just my job. It's not my team. Um, mm. I, I hope I'd have the ability to pick them up and put them on my back if need be. But at the same time, I, I need everybody to, to be performing well. And that means keeping them included and, and feeling valued in the side. So which it's just neither one's good nor bad and it, mm. it doesn't really matter. It's all about results at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, we're, we're just very different in that regard, but I loved playing under Meg, I just thought, um, her leadership tactically like very switched on. And, and I know that cause I was standing with the gloves on and she was standing at first slip and we just talked cricket all day, um, which was cool. So yeah, just without being able to pinpoint it, it's just, mm. it's slightly different, but, um, I think it's a good thing as well. And I'm all right in saying that only now you fully appreciate what actually is racing through yeah. the captain's mind. So you might've been having those conversations and looking at her going, oh, well, this isn't too hard. She's just manipulating the field a bit, maybe thinking about who's coming on next or where the game's at. Mm. But now you're actually in it and you go, oh, this is a bit different to what it actually looked like, even though she was standing three feet away. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think probably appreciate now like, the ability that I had to be able to help her with some of that stuff as well, like standing there talking about it, you know, she's thinking about a thousand things, but we might pinpoint some things that we can do in the game moving forward um, that she either acts on or she doesn't. It may have been a hindrance as well. I'm only speaking on my half. Um, but yeah, I can. Yeah. Would she, would she shut up? <laughs> yeah. I can fully appreciate why she's standing at first loop with her arms closed, with her arms folded like that, with her sunnies on and looking a little bit grumpy because I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's at first slip for you? Um, oh, Beth Mooney does it a fair bit, yeah. but if there's a genuine cordon, it's Phoebe Litchfield at the moment. And uh, okay. you'll see me with my arms folded and a pissed off <laughs> look on my face because I'm like, shut up. <laughs> Phoebe go, did you see what this person ticked? <laughs> yes. It's like nothing about the game. It's like, oh my God, have you seen this girl's bat swing? Or like, well, why has she got that grip on her bat? Or like this and that. And I'm like. Trying to think about the game. Whereas Beth is maybe Beth's thinking quiet. more along the lines of how do we move this game forward? Beth's thinking about, um, hey, Midge, how about you bowl Kingy from the other end? Or okay. like, yeah. have, let's find a way <laughs> to get me and slip more often so that I don't have to run around. So Fair it's enough. funny. Uh, last one. Brenton yeah. asks, favorite keepers out of this three? <laughs> Haddon, Gilchrist, Ian Healy. Oh. I mean, this all depends on how good Uncle Ian's Christmas presents were, I'm guessing. <laughs> Non-existent. Whoa. Um, really? I didn't give him one either, so it's fine. No, but even when you were a kid? Oh, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, I was yeah, going to yeah. say, yeah. around. Surely he could come up with a pretty good bat or something. He was a kookaburra man as well, wasn't he? Mm. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> Best keeper. Who you'd pick? Out I of those think, three? look, <clears throat> oh, this is hard. I think as a pure keeper, I'm going to go with Uncle Ian. Mm -hmm. um, I love all three, so this is really hard, but I 
Adam Gilchrist is an all-round cricketer. Yeah. Unbelievable. No one's ever living up to that at any point in time. Um, but funnily enough, I think I'm most like Hads, which is a bit scary. Um, mm. Yeah, Moddy used to call me Hads in the nets, like when I was, I basically back foot defend and everything like he does. It's all a bit weird. This is all very weird then that where you've ended up doing a podcast, well, three times out of the 52 weeks with Hads when he's yep. actually here. So, Well, yeah, I think I'm probably more like him. A lot of my um, my style is probably more like Hads because I probably watched him the most, whereas yep. Uncle Ian was doing his thing when I was very young. So mm. I probably do things more like Hads than any of the other two. Fair enough. And you don't try and do things like Adam Kilchrist because Adam Kilchrist could, uh, <laughs> he's just he's an outlier. Well, I mean, and I've chatted to him about wiki keeping and about cricket, and I think he's just one of those guys that's like, can't necessarily explain what, how he did it or why he did it. It was just came naturally to him, which not many um, athletes are, are fortunate enough to have. Neither can Monty Panesar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hills, thank you for that. That was the secret cricket club questions. We'll mm. do a few of those. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll see you when we resume our regular weekly chats. Mm -hmm. I think it's about mid-August that we're thinking of. But the next three weeks, Phoebe Litchfield, Mark Taylor, Mike Whitney mm. are the chats. So... Yeah, looking forward to all of those and, um, yeah, have a good time with the rest of your pre-season strike break. Enjoy. That was Willow Talk. Catch you soon. Yeah, thanks for watching the Willow Talk podcast on YouTube. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you don't have to miss an episode wherever you are. And while you're at it, check out these videos up here. They're mostly good.